approach this from a bunch of different perspectives, colored by our guests, our panelists, and their respective expertise. We'll try to tie this together. Now, this is a summit. When I think of a summit, that means that people are supposed to ask questions. People are supposed to walk away with some of the things that are in their head at the end of this day answered. So please don't hesitate to raise your hand. If you have a question on a particular topic, let's try to, uh, to integrate those questions as we move along. Uh, my name is Bob Hobit. I'm an attorney in uh, the United States. Uh, I work out of Denver, Colorado. I lead uh, the cannabis industry group for an international law firm called Clark Hill. Clark Hill has an office here at Dublin. Uh, my partners, uh, Sean and Sam, are sitting in the audience today and, and uh, really, really, really pleased to be here. Um, really happy to be in Ireland talking about something that's new or hopefully going to uh, accelerate the conversation because it's public policy that, of course, is controversial. But if done correctly, it can be a change that actually benefits society, that benefits and perhaps provides cover for politicians and, and bureaucrats and the like. Um, I want to introduce to my left, uh, Mariana Larrea. Mariana is a life sciences and corporate attorney from Mexico. Uh, she also, uh, she recently left a law firm in Mexico City um, and became the director of a project called uh, Santorio Gome, which is in Tulum, outside of Tulum in, on uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It is a multi-hundred unit development for industrial hemp. And Mariana will shed some light on uh, some of the things that uh, involve sourcing hemp material if you're going to build in this day and age. Is there anything else that I missed that you'd like that? Let the, uh, let the audience know is in your background. Yeah, I know. Well, I am a life sciences attorney. Cannabis in Mexico is regulated in the general health law. So as a pharmaceutical, like science and healthcare attorney, I started reviewing all these matters since 2016, when in Mexico, the regulations start. So the, well, the last year I had the opportunity uh, to join this beautiful project uh, that we are going to create the first hemp living community in Mexico. And the only reason why I quit my, my nice firm in Mexico City and I moved to live near the sea is because in this project we're doing three important things. Number one, we're educating each time we, are, we talk about the project people, if they buy it or not, they finally say a go with more information. Number two, we're showing the government a legal business in hemp in Mexico. Uh, we're going to import right now the uh, materials. And the third one is, and the third one is that uh, we are opening the industry, right? And people may be different between hemp and uh, cannabis uh, for uh, for adult uses or medicinal uses, and in times they don't understand that when we are opening the industry for him, we are also opening the industry for all the family of cannabis. Right? Cannabis is a word that means is the name of the family of all the plants, and this is one of the things I want to discuss today, guys, about the importance of the definitions in our regulations and in the law. Because in Mexico, the problem, it is not that cannabis, it is not legal. It is about the definitions that are not clear. So the authorities have no uh, tools for, uh, for opening this industry. But uh, this is the reason why I quit the firm and now I am leading this project. And uh, well, I'll be very happy to see you around in Tulum and Cancun, Mexico. Uh, we have a beautiful place there to show. And also this is a a good destination because it's a well-known international destination. So we're not only uh, going to educate and open these for Mexicans, also this is open for worldwide for the cannabis industry. I am picturing this place for cannabis industry to be all around and instead to going and pay uh, a lot of thousand uh, dollars in nice and fancy hotel, you already have your Hemp jungle house in a jungle of Tulum, right? Uh, in a really nice resort, but that is only a little bit of the prey. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, and then also uh, to my left is uh, Mike Corral from Armenino LLP. Armenino is a finance, 
tax technology and consulting firm, one of the top 25 in the United States. Uh, Mike Mike specializes in working in the cannabis industry. He's worked all over the United States and operates uh, with other international folks in the space. Mike, tell us a little bit that, more about yourself for for uh, your background and involvement in the cannabis space, please. Yeah, I was with you know one of the big four accounting firms and realized that cannabis was going to be something that was going to go state by state. And so I moved from Texas to California uh, before it became legal there at the Prop 64 uh, in 2015. And then started learning about the cannabis industry. Eventually, I wrote a treatise as a book, a research book on multi-state cannabis taxation for talks of borders. And so I went through each state and how they tax this industry, whether you're a cultivator, manufacturer, distributor, or retailer. Um, and each state has their, their own rules, their own tax system, you know, to tax this industry. It's very confusing for, for cannabis companies. And then most recently, about two years ago during COVID, I moved from California to New Jersey as I saw this industry moving eastward in the U.S. <coughs> well, like, thank you for joining us. Uh, and then, Bo, you did not miss a thing. Thank you for, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was in the same boat. I just, uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't know where I was going this morning either. But Bo with me is, uh, as a friend, he and I have quite literally traveled the world together. We were talking, uh, it seems like every time we're in a car together, uh, people are driving on the wrong side of the road. Uh, and uh, that happened to get here in Ireland. Uh, Bo worked for New Frontier Data, one of the larger data companies in the United States and in the world, focusing on the Canada space. He left uh, New Frontier uh, several years ago and began Whitney Economics. Uh, he's regarded as one of the top uh, economists in the entire cannabis space, projecting uh, the cannabis industry. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by the cannabis industry in a moment. But Bo, tell us, uh, tell the audience a little bit more about your background, perhaps, and even like highlight. Yeah, sure. So um, it's nice to be here eventually. <laughs> or finally. Um, yeah, I have, I took a circuitous route uh, into the cannabis industry. I had really nothing to do with it. I was uh, doing the flight economics at Intel Corporation and sizing up their supply chain and doing global supply chain work. Um, and I was teaching economics at a university when Oregon, the state of Oregon on the west coast of the United States, was just in the, on the cusp of legalizing on the Dolgi side. Um, and so I started looking at the market. One of my students was in the industry already, and I asked him how big the industry was. He said, I don't know, you're the economist, you tell me. Um, and so I took that challenge quite literally and, and uh, started looking into it, realizing uh, at what point that it was just this huge market. And so I changed it with both fee um, and was quickly picked up by a, a vertically integrated company, and they wanted me to run their operations. So we eventually uh, went from adult use or medical to adult use. And then we were the first company to go public on the Canadian Securities Exchange uh, via a uh, reverse takeover at RTO. Um, and so we kind of paved the way for um, Canvas, um, you know, public offerings in Canada with U.S. offerings. Um, and with that, being the chief operations officer, I got a, a really good perspective all facets of the canvas industry and from growing to processing and distribution, retail. And so then I started using that and developing some of my economic theories. And so I started just trying to answer general questions about business and the economics of cannabis. And so I started building the foundation for others to use in the economics community. There's not a whole lot of folks in the space right now. I'm not yet. Add that. There's a lot of interest that not a lot of folks actually have to participation. Ken, um, so we lay the foundation and, you know, on, um, you know, consumer behavior, business behavior, a labor, a taxation, a government that influence on the market for the line. So try to build a body of work in economics and just uh, focus in on that while other people did good work in tax and in legal and other areas. So... I see, and it might store it. And when you talk to people about numbers in the cannabis industry, there tends to be a little bit of an exaggeration because we all want to talk about how exciting and how successful the industry is. And some days that's true, other days that's not true. 
but it's very critical. It's very important when you're trying to make your case, whether that's to support public policy, whether your company's raising money, whether you're out there in the marketplace looking for partners, it's very important to have accurate information, real information, and information that is based in reality, particularly when you're talking about numbers. Um, over the next hour plus, we're gonna talk about some of the market numbers. We're gonna talk about the markets themselves. We'll talk a little bit about some of the reg. I just, that perhaps uh, Ireland can participate in, if not, uh, this entire region in terms of what commerce will look like. And as I mentioned, please just read for him if you have a question and we'll try to work those in along the way. Uh, two comments at the outset. Uh, there is indeed a global cannabis industry. No make no mistake about it. Sometimes those of us that work in a particular country or in the U.S. a particular state or region, we understand what's happening in our region. But everything is connected. And you say, how can everything be connected when, particularly in the United States, the industry is illegal, right? Marijuana. And, and by the way, let me say this. I'm going to use the term marijuana to refer to the marijuana side of the industry, meaning high THC products. I'm going to use the word hemp when I talk about non-intoxicating uh, the compounds and industrial uses. Um, all of those things, in my opinion, fall under what I call the cannabis industry. So you might hear people talk about the cannabis industry, and they just mean marijuana. But the cannabis industry, based on what I've seen and how I've worked in the industry for 14 years now, really has two distinct sectors, hemp and marijuana. And that's less pronounced when you travel internationally because they make less of a hard-line distinction between the two. But I wanted to frame that for you. So the, and, and both of these are not meant to be scientific numbers, but... The global cannabis industry is projected to be $75 billion within the next three to four years. Those numbers could be higher or lower depending on which uh, projection sources you use. But roughly, roughly half of that number comes from North America. And then the other half of that number is the rest of the world and the aggregate. And this is quite significant because even when you think about participating in this industry, some venture capitalist funds and, and equity funds, they'll say, well, the cannabis industry is very small. Uh, I'm not going to pay attention to it yet. And that's true when you compare it to some other things, but it's not a small industry, not by any stretch of the imagination, and it is indeed global. So what is the cannabis industry? The cannabis industry involves, as I mentioned, hemp. It involves marijuana. It involves the technologies that overlay those sectors. It's international. It's domestic. We're talking about industrial uses. We're talking about pharmaceutical uses. We're talking about consumer uses for wellness and for uh, other non-intoxicating uh, properties of the plant. And you're talking about, in many jurisdictions, recreational or adult use, the polite way, perhaps, to talk about using cannabis without regulation. And I believe there are four distinct public policy lays that already exist when you're talking about cannabis. The first is industrial uses. It kind of speaks for itself. When I talk about industrial uses, you can imagine what I mean. Fiber, writer, plastic, fuel, building materials, so forth and so on. These are historical uses. And by the way, I'll know, in the 1930s, there was a magazine article in a, in a magazine called Popular Mechanics. That magazine projected hemp to be the next billion, fee, billion dollar industry. In the 1930s, they were talking about hemp being a billion dollar industry. And here we are many years later, after public policy changes and the like, actually starting to see this occur. So that first of the four lanes is the industrial lane. The second lane, when I call over-the-counter marijuana, this is when you go buy a flower or an oil distilled from that flower or an infused product which is intended to produce a structural active effect. It has high THC. Think of our dispensary system in the United States. Think of what Germany is about to do. Think of what Czech Republic is about to do, so forth and so on. I call it over-the-counter marijuana because there's very little distinction between medical and adult use in most markets except how it qualifies the purchaser of that product. If I'm in an adult use marketplace, I simply have to be 21. If I'm in a medical marketplace, I simply have to have a doctor validate 
that have one of a range of conditions. It's a mere qualifier for how you purchase the product. Second of the four lanes. The other two, the pharmaceutical lane. This is a different lane than the over-the-counter marijuana lane. And I would question anyone that suggests that over-the-counter marijuana is actually medical marijuana. Not because there's that efficacy, there certainly is. But it's over-the-counter marijuana. The pharmaceutical complex, the medicinal complex, they control this third lane. It requires approval by FDA and like bonds, different jurisdictions around the world for specific conditions. We exist so rich. And then the fourth lane is what I call wellness or nutritional products. Think of CBD. Think of protein from hip. These are compounds from a cannabis plant that don't produce a high, that are regulated as foods or supplements in the marketplace. And that, of course, is evolving as well, particularly when you throw in the fact that there are novel foods here in Europe. Um, ultimately, I believe you have to have a balanced public policy approach when you legalize cannabis in any jurisdiction. What do I mean by balance? Look at some of the Latin American countries that initially came out of the box. Look at Colombia. Look at Uruguay. They looked at export-only models. We can't really have an economy based on an export-only model in a brand new industry. It doesn't work. So you have to balance that with some semblance of a domestic industry as well. And that's what we're seeing begin to evolve. I think Colombia is a good example of that, where they started out with export only. And by the way, they only allowed the exportation of oil initially. They changed that law, recognizing that the market dictated that flowers needed to be exported as well. And now they're embarking on a domestic distribution and a regulated system. So for, for, the, for their country. So my point is, with that balance, I think you create the most economic opportunity. So those of you that lobby or work in public policy, please think of that, because you can't have a successful industry just participating on one side or the other. And then the last thing I'll say before we dive into some of the numbers, Bo, is, um, is the United Nations, right? Let's talk about the United Nations for just a moment. And it's an important thing when you think about the UN Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which effectively has been in existence for dozens and dozens of years now. It classifies cannabis as a highly restricted drug, and all of its member nations have had to enact very strict control policies around cannabis, around marijuana. Well, that changed. Recent, November of 2020, the Committee on Narcotic Drugs adopted a new recognition for medicinal cannabis for the first time. They said this is a thing that's different and should be controlled differently than drug-type marijuana, for example, as they referred to it. Another thing that happened by the United Nations at that same period of time is they began to recognize that CBD and non-intoxicating compounds like CBD from hemp fall under the industrial exception found under the UN Convention. So my point is law and regulations color all of this, but it's entrepreneurs and markets that drive it. So, Bo, let's talk about some of the numbers market-wise and and take this however you'd like to, to, to go with this. I think it would be good to sort of level set. What does the, uh, the global economy look like? I threw my number out there that I read. And then how does that, in your mind, uh, break down my range? Yeah, sure. So when you when forecasters try to predict what the total demand is, they look towards consumption. They look towards surveys that are being conducted by the U.N., by these various uh, governmental agencies, health authorities, and the like. And generally, it goes like this. They call you up by the phone. They say, hi, I'm from the government. Do you smoke wheat? Yes or no? And so in countries where it's prohibited, everybody's going to respond, uh, and no, I don't know anybody that does. So can those surveys in the um, countries that... I don't know, I've this, the responses and the consumption rates are recorded that's very, very low. In other countries, like Uruguay or Canada or the United States, when somebody calls you up from the government and says, do you smoke weed, um, when it's normalized and when there's distribution channels and all sorts of stuff, then the percentage of people that admit to using cannabis in the previous year or in the previous month, it's relatively high. And so... Um, a lot of the demand is based upon consumption, and then they assign a value to that consumption, and then the number of consumers. So it's consumers, 
consumption spends. Uh, from the numbers from the UNODC, um, based upon these projections, the total global market is between 250 and $350 million. And I think this is extremely underreported um, because in the United States, the total market and illicit and legal is over $100 billion a month. So that would mean that the U.S. market is roughly a third of the total global demand. Um, and I'm just, I'm just not buying that. Um, and so, but from a consumption or a consumer perspective, the largest market in the world is actually an Asian. Uh, it's China, it's India, um, it's the Asian countries, and then Africa, and then, then the U.S. and Europe. And so when you look at it from a consumer perspective, those are the largest markets in the, in the world. Um, but from a dollar or a euro perspective, the largest market is in North America, and specifically the U.S. Uh, and then the European market from a dollar or a euro perspective is the second largest market from a, for a revenue perspective. Um, what I'm to do kind of is that as the global marketplace normalizes, the prices in these U.S. market and European market will actually fall. And so there'll be some normalization of the market and the, 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 the this total addressable market, still legal and, and legal, will kind of normalize and, and shake out. And then you'll start seeing, uh, you know, the value of the Asian market relative to the European and the U.S. markets. Um, and so, so you can look at it from a dollar or a euro perspective, or you can look at it from a consumer perspective. And I do both. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's often overlooked about supply. And so where is the supply coming from? So my firm has developed models that looks at supply, particularly in the United States, about where the supply is coming from. Um, and then the value of that supply as well. So, Mike, what are some of the things that are industry or market chillers? We talked about tax evil. We were preparing for this. Uh, Big EF's comments on inflation. Just some other thoughts on what prevents a new program from actually succeeding. What what Stein is more? Yeah, and you know, it's one of the lessons that I think Ireland and other countries could learn from what's happened here in the the U.S. What? generally happens is, is state and local governments determine how much revenue they want to generate from cannabis taxation. So let's call it a hundred billion. And then they figure out, well, this is how many and how much in sales we have to add that we expect will generate a hundred billion in, in tax. And then they back into it and they figure, okay, when is the tax rate that I have to have? times the amount of sales that will equal 100 billion. And they work backwards this way because they want to budget, you know, $100 billion of, of tax revenue coming from, from cannabis. Um, but unfortunately, what that does is it creates such a high tax rate that the illegal market just thrives because they have no regulation, they have no testing, they have no uh, tax obligations. And so... Um, they, they do quite well. I mean, we're seeing this right now in New York City, where the work recently uh, became adult use label, and they've only granted four licenses. And of those four licenses, uh, two of them are, you know, social equity licenses that we call, where people that have been arrested or incarcerated in, um, for drug trafficking in the past they're trying to make amends to them and say, hey, let's, you know, that it's legal, let's expunge their, their criminal records, let's, you know, make it so that they get a uh, first opportunity into this new business in New York. Um, um, but problem is with, with only four legal dispensaries, there are countless illegal dispensaries that are selling goods now. And the problem is, is that when they get caught, they basically get a, a slam on the wrist, fine, and that's it. And then they turn around, and next week they have another shot hole. Just really quickly, to that point, there was an article the other day. There was, a, there was a store near Times Square, not licensed. It was shut down four consecutive times. It just keeps opening again, to your point, because there's no repercussion. There's no 
Nobody gets arrested. Maybe they get a ticket, but it's legal. It's just not licensed and regulated completely yet. And that's but perhaps a unique job. Yeah. That, that, you know, and it's very surprising that here in the U.S. that, you know, we saw this in, in Colorado, in California, Washington, Oregon, all these states that, that became adult use legal years ago that now these new states on the East Coast are making the very same mistakes. Uh, and, you know, even in New York, there have been attacks on cannabis not based on the purchase price, but on THC content, which is also a, kind of a, a dangerous way of doing this because it gives an incentive for some of these uh, testing labs, you know, to be paid a little extra money and say, hey, just make it, you know, not 100 milligrams, make it, show as 90 milligrams because it is a lower tax. It's just not a good way to, to really force a uh, attack system on the heat. So just to supplement this a little bit, uh, another common mistake that's made from state to state to state related to tax is that they expect this huge surge of tax uh, immediately out of the gate. And they don't realize that it takes a while, it takes a couple of years to deploy a legal program and then develop the rules, and then refine the rules. And throughout that process, more and more, um, there was a full participate in the legal system. And so there's a ramp that takes place in terms of not only illicit to legal consumer conversions, but the amount of tax that's generated at the state level. And so it'll ultimately get us aware their objectives are if they if they do things right, if they don't tax too much and disincentivize consumer behavior out. And, conversion. It'll eventually get there, but it takes a while. And I think uh, setting expectations with legislators and with regulators on their, uh, a realistic ramp is, is extremely important in the work. As that straight. Uh, that is an important part of the regulation in all around the world. The classic situation are how we're going to Establish in the law under the regulation what is THC, what is CBD, what is a cannabinoid. And I don't know, guys, he's a question for us. If it is correct to classify the cannabis industry regarding the percent of cannabinoids in the product, you know, because that is a problem. If you are putting more taxes because you have. Oh, okay, three. Then, uh, da, da, then the system it, it is not going to operate the correct way. It, uh, in a life sciences as and as a pharmaceutical attorney, I can tell we have in the general health law the definition of THC in the classification of a controlled substance, where the law states that is a major public health problem products which contain more than one percent of THC and this is a mistake so when we are going uh, to talk about starting the regulation we need to be clear with those definitions in order to not repeat our mistakes because we're here to talk about our regulations the mistakes we've been through and uh, we want to help you to to not go to the same things as, as us but only was it with no no it's great so so think about this stuff think about when a government decides to actually put a, a law or a regulation in place and they start to tax you on THC content, it's almost like the government saying, hey, we're doing you a favor, public. We're allowing these compounds to be introduced into society and we're going to tax it upon how much fun you can have or how much THC in it. When the right approach is not that approach, it's the exact opposite. It's Bo is what Bo and Mike described is when a government looks at the industry and says, what can the industry do for the government? Not what the government can do for the industry. That's the way that things become move, move forward. So if the government can rely on the taxation, the tax dollars, they can do things and you can show that. And for those of you making an argument uh, or talking with public policymakers, you can look no further than Pick a state in the United States. Pick a, a country in Latin America. You can show that those tax dollars have been put to use for schools, for education campaigns, for roads, for public buildings, for the public health. 
There are so many things that come out of taxation for the cannabis industry, and it's all positive. But it's not about the government saying, we will allow you to do this. What can we do for you? It should be the other way around. What can the private sector in a new industry do for the government, which ultimately benefits the people? Now, Ariane, I'd like to come back to, uh, to some of the things you talked about. Uh, we talked about other markets trying to get off the ground uh, and having been off the ground like the U.S. market. But of course, what's happening in Mexico? Mexico, of course, is 135 million people, as I understand it. Very, very large country by way of population. Uh, its Supreme Court had issued a, a finding four years ago that says you have to uh, allow for and create a law for adult use or dispensaries, for lack of a better way to put it. But that hasn't happened yet. So talk about the, the three different policy lanes, medical, adult abuse, and, and, and the hemp, and uh, what's happening in Mexico and how it relates, you think, to general global policy development. So um, in Mexico, everything starts with the medicinal regulation. We start because uh, at trial, an uh, individual go against the government asking a permission for a vegan. So after this first trial, they won. A ton of trials came, right? Not only for the medicinal area, also for the recreational sure. or adult use area. And uh, for good, in 2017, we had our first amendment in the general health law, which allowed us to grow cannabis for medicinal and uh, uh, clinical research purposes, right? Uh, and that 2021, January, we are two years after that. The health authority execute the regulations for the medicinal industry. These regulations are uh, are really interesting because for first time the health ministry execute a regulation in which other authorities are related, and it's kind of a copy of the drugs regulation we had before, but they added the word cannabis, right? Cannabinoids, THC, CBD. So uh, what is important and is curious is that we have a 100% legal medicinal system, but we do not have access for cannabis in medicinal purposes, right? We can't go to a drugstore. We even though we do not find the CBD oils, uh, you know, in the pharmacies, you need to obtain these in maybe Instagram, Facebook, in social media, and is there Amazon it is not selling in Mexico CBD? So what is the problem here and the lesson from this industry, this medicinal area for today? We need to understand that medicinal cannabis is not only about the pharma industry, right? We need to understand there are other ways for having access to medicinal cannabis uh, that will not take no, us a lot of time because for the pharma industry, the medicinal uh, cannabis will take a lot of years with clinical research, a lot of investment for developing these drugs. And by the way, congratulations, Guy, for with all your, what are you doing here? Um, but this takes time and takes money. And it's an industry that a lot of people is scared or does not know enough, right? Example, the law firm I was working in was a really challenge to bring the law firm into, into the Cali's interest because people it is afraid all the time when they saw the cannabis behind the scent, right? So the lesson here is to understand that the cannabis, medi the medicinal cannabis, it is not only aimed for the pharmaceutical industry and that there are other ways and systems to give access for the patients for cannabis without needing to wait all this time and all this money and all this immersion, right? And uh, investment source. And uh, second, hemp, industrial hemp. In this 2017, in this amendment, uh, was the exemption and we are allowed to extra commercialize hemp or products which contain cannabinoids that does not uh, have more than 1% of THC. And here come a thing of definition. In a lot of regulations, the, it is stated that if the product contains or the crop contains 
more than 1% of THC, that is recreational or medicinal. But if it contains less than 1% of THC, it can. This is not right. Hemp that had a specific plant with a specific genetic and that yes, this plant uh, generates low percent of THC. But the thing here is again, the classification. What my law states is that I can commercialize import and export products which contain not, not more than 1% of THC, not only in hemp, right? Uh, so this part of the definitions and the classification uh, that we're going to start working here in Europe is really important. And uh, well, hemp is legal, but it is not regulated. Again, guys, it is about regulation, not over-regulation, okay? Because when governments and later are scared about regulating, they, they tend to over-regulate. And if you over-regulate a market with taxes, if you over-regulate a market with a new regulation for cannabis that says the same thing, the other one, you know, can trouble. So, so let's keep it simple, please. And the third thing is recreational. It's really funny in the recreational area in Mexico. Uh, in 2020, the Supreme Court executed a decree which states that the parts of the articles which means the prohibition for consumption of cannabis are not more legal. But the Supreme Court only state a document. They do not amend the law. So uh, now what uh, consumers are doing, they are going before the Federal Commission Against Sanitary Race, which is a single of MBA, ask for a permission of consumption. And now they have permission, but we do not have a market. So where are they going to find the cannabis? In the other market, right? But now with a permission. So you let me know which is worse, not regulate or have a lack in our regulations because we are scared of an industry that we do not know or is instead regulating with clear rules. In my perspective, these decrees of the Supreme Court uh, means a lot more danger for public scale that consumers are following a permission with products that are not regulated, right? So um, only a little bit about what is happening in Mexico. So I want to just add to that a little bit because we've been talking about taxes, been talking about total addressable market, and you know, like 250 to 350 million, but that's just on the adult use and medical side. Uh, and when it comes to tax policy, I don't think our regulators and, and policy experts really understand the health market enough to be the tax. And so, but for perspective, a lot of folks say that have this, the little sisters have been cannabis. Um, when in fact, with just some simple uh, market share um, adjustments over to hemp, substitute products in automotive, in plastics, uh, in wellness and the like, um, the, the hemp industry globally is at a minimum of 350 million or 350 billion dollars in total addressable market just on 10 product types alone. And so if you add the industrial side of cannabis to the adult use in medical, um, it's a half a trillion to a trillion dollar market with a T. So, you know, and so it takes um, policymakers, it takes them time to understand the nuances of the market that have this really three markets in one. It's fiber, it's grain, and it's cadavanols, right? So people and policymakers don't necessarily understand that. And so when you're going into these settings, when you're trying to look at starting a business, changing policies, looking at tax projections and the like, you really have to become an educator before you can become an influencer. And what, what other thing about hemp, by the way? Who's heard of Delta 8? Raise your hand. All right, so Delta 8 is a controversial topic, right? It's an intoxicating compound derived from the hemp plant, but not the Delta 9 THC. Guess what? This is illegal in the United States. There was a Ninth Circuit federal court about two months ago that came out and said Delta E, quote unquote, comfortably fits within the definition of hemp and the farm bill definition. Just last week, 
the DEA came out and it had a chance to say that Delta-8 was a synthetic continent and that it was illegal. It didn't do that. Instead, it only talked about THCO, which is a non-naturally occurring product. My point is, this is a legal product in the United States. It's also what I call red state weed. The red states, the conservative states in the United States, they probably won't adopt dispensaries, but they'll allow for intoxicating compounds from hemp to be sold in the marketplace. So this is a brand new variation of what the hemp in the is, and it's very challenging. Um, I want to summarize some things and then Bo, let's sort of shift to Europe. Our, our objective is to sort of talk about North America and the global economy, talk about some numbers, but also focus on what's happening in Europe. On the taxation piece, we talked about New York, perhaps overtaxed and overregulated. It is an eighth of an ounce of cannabis will cost you about $70 to $80. Are you going to go buy, if you're a consumer, an $80 eighth of cannabis from a store when the guy that you've always purchased it from will sell it to you for $25 or $40? I don't think so. And this is the challenge. So that's one model, overtax, overregulate. Now look at what they did in Oregon. This was years ago. This was the first country. I've, I've drafted public policy for over 30 countries around the world in this area. Uruguay was the very first. And what they did was they said, we're going to set the price point per gram below the black market or the illicit market. Paraguay, the largest illicit marijuana producer in Latin America, sends much, much of its cannabis into to Uruguay. Well, so they set the price at $1.50 per gram because the black market, the Paraguayan cannabis, was sold at $1.75 or $2 per gram. That's one way to combat it. Whether that works or not remains to be seen, but it certainly beats this idea of an $80 to eight of cannabis. Um, Bo, let's talk about the exciting opportunities in Europe. Uh, Fain is now our focus on the distal and the strap, um, and uh, also the uh, Derby, uh, you know, Czech Republic will be covered. And uh, as I said earlier, I, I think Czech will probably beat Germany, but we'll see. It's going to be a great race. Uh, a really great race. The race is on. Uh, but let's talk about uh, some of the drafts that can be up to. And like me, feel free to chime in on the uh, yeah, well. yeah, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, from a revenue perspective, uh, Europe is the, the second largest market in the world. Um, and it's split up between medicinal and then these emerging um, uh, adult use countries and the like. Um, but from a, just a consumption perspective, it's interesting to know that Italy is actually the largest um, market by from a consumption perspective. There's just a lot of folks in, in Italy that really enjoy this. Uh, but what's, you know, what's the key to these deployments like in Europe and the United States and the like, and I'm not sure if we're going to talk about that now or, or a little bit, but um, the key to a, a successful regulatory rollout is have a, enough supply in addition to decent pricing relative to the Lisa market and uh, access for the consumers. So if one of those three is out of whack, then it really slows down the pace of reform, the pace of conversion, and the amount of legal capture that the government and, uh, and country can get. Um, and so in when I looked at Germany last year, they really don't have enough domestic supply to support their RAM into the adult use space. Um, and so they're going to have to do stuff. They were right now, they're willing to resistant to, to opening up the market to foreign suppliers. Um, and so they're going to struggle and they're not going to achieve what their goals that they're, that they're trying to meet. Uh, meanwhile, this, uh, just the thought of legalization in Germany has uh, driven policy uh, reform in a lot of the European nations, there's about conversations and during COVID, for example, the, the, uh, I don't know, French police asked the, uh, French government to do more to reform and legalize and get more supply of cannabis on the market because it was becoming such a problem. So even the police are asking the governments to do reform. Um, in Spain, there's, um, discussions in portion, um, there's, they've decriminalized it. Um, and so there's all these, oh, and then in Italy, they're also looking at, at legalizing as well. Um, what's similar about Europe, 
um, to the United States is that there's all these different models for legalization um, and different strategies, um, none that's been unified quite yet um, in Europe. And it's the same thing that's spoke not uh, in, uh, in the United States. So I think ultimately what will happen is once there's enough momentum, now keep in mind there's 70 countries in the world now or, or in excess of 70 countries that have some type of legal access to either cannabinoids, adult use, or medical. So this is an emerging uh, industry that's accelerating in pace of reform. And I think Europe is going to be on the forefront of that um, uh, and may actually uh, displace the United States from a, uh, from a market perspective because they'll, uh, they, they just take a different approach to taxation and regulation than does defense states. I go the, that that's your, uh, is it made the United States the way. So I need guys you to regulate to so United States, push the regulation and then Mexico follow that, right? Well, but it's an important point for better or for worse than any countries do look at the United States, and they're fearful of that relationship with the United States, uh, particularly Latin America. That's my, my experience is they don't want to step outside of U.S. policy for fear of losing relationships, business opportunities, and just, you know, general diplomacy. And uh, I think that that's a, a major challenge. Even the United Nations, I was in Vienna, Austria four years ago for the Committee on Narcotic Drugs. They were supposed to make the change they made in November of last year four years ago but they didn't because the United States was resistant. So there seems to be this notion that we're gonna wait for the United States to give us approval, but the United States policy is just so messed up, for lack of a better way to put it, on all things cannabis, but at the same time, it has the most consumers, as Bo points out, and perhaps the most robust marketplace. Um, you know, there's also, there's also, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, you know, in Canada, it's federally legal there, and we still haven't seen, you know, any of the benefits of Canadian um, legalization to spread around the world and to say, hey, let's use the Canadian model uh, in other countries. And so it's, it's been unfortunate that it's still the U.S. that drives everything. And this is because it is not about regulation. It's about industry. It is about the market. You know, regulation are only the, the things we need to follow, but... Uh, regulators need to hear and to understand the industry in order to create regulations in accordance for those markets, right? For sure. So might um, shift a little bit to some of the, the consumer patterns in the markets. Uh, what we were talking, uh, you talked a little bit about things that don't exist in the marketplace. There's a branding for products, uh, product development, um, what are some of those opportunities for calendars? So if there are folks participating in the European market, what could they observe and do differently for hacks from a market set? Yeah, one of the things that's been very successful in the U.S. is Brandy. Uh, many of the companies that are on the West Coast, you know, it's becoming a saturated market there. Uh, there's so many competitors that the only way to stand out is to have a, a recognizable brand. And so those companies are now the you know, eastward with their brand, also going worldwide when my clients is cookies. And they now have 50 dispensaries across the US. They've opened up one in the UK, uh, one in Vienna, one in Tel Aviv. And, and so they're becoming a worldwide brand uh, like Coca-Cola so that it would be rentedized no matter what country you're in. And by getting that brandy, people that gravitate to a certain brand understand that if I buy a, a, a product from Bill, I get a certain effect. I like that effect. And still those and go off that consistency. It's like a McDonald's yeah, where you could go anywhere in the world at, 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 and have a McDonald's and it's going to be the same. Um, that's going to be very important you know, in order to you know get investors and, and others excited about this company versus competitor that no one has heard about. The other thing is, is that you know, look across this road. It's it's mainly men that are in this room today. And this market is really still geared towards, you know, 21 to 35-year-old men. And the products serve for that. Well, the packaging is, 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 you know, geared for that demographic. And so there needs to be more 
women in this industry, more products for women, uh, packaging and things that appeal to women, and it is still so male-dominated. That's an area that I think is very right um, in Europe and all over the world, really, uh, to you know, produce products that, that really would appeal to 50% of the hockey list. Well, from very on any comment that, based on what you've seen markets around the world, what do you notice in SHS? Male driven pilots, female driven pilots, is there a, is there a hole in the marketplace? Yes, I, I think it is a hole. In Mexico, also, we, we have a hole. I think uh, that, well, for good or for bad, this industry is being opened by, by men, right? Back then. And, uh, but it is my belief, and yesterday I was talking with very, that is very new, like, about uh, women being scared to come in this industry. And that is part of our work, right? Uh, because, as I mentioned before, every time you say cannabis, there is a stigma behind it. And uh, if this is a market that is being opened by men, you know? women were like yes or not and i think this will with time take the place in the moment you know uh this is about all countries starting to regulate and uh women were trying to come in the industry and the effects i i saw in other countries in united states in latin america i told her yesterday it is in mexico we we are starting to to get together in order for start pushing companies up. But first of all, we need to identify ourselves, our roles in the industry and how we can play this. And guys, this is also really important uh, for you to know. And I am really thank you. And I am honored to be in this panel with you guys. Uh, this is really important, okay? Uh, giving a space for women because we, for always, we will have a different point of view than you. You are, I was just today, some came with someone here and he went like, uh, okay, male, we, we are, we are aggressive. We want to go out. We want to fight and take uh, money and bring it home. Right. And women, we're so careful. We build families. We, we create that, the base of the society. Right. So those two points of view in one industry are really important and to make uh, also if we're starting with all these industry to to give it uh, a, a change right and you said something interesting over the few moments when you talked about over regulation the word over regulation and bought and and sometimes I look at the existing system and we're looking at when I call the dispensary system, right? The sort of US-based way of selling cannabis over the counter, which uh, is ultimately the, the model that we're seeing it adopted globally. I would suggest we're at, the, we're at the 10 year mark of the cannabis industry. And we have to reevaluate this dispensary system model because it is overtaxed. It is overregulated. We see in the United States that these companies are dying left and right because of being strangled by overregulation and overtaxation. How do you create an operable market without overtaxation and overregulation? We clear the conditions. The problem with THC is that THC is uh, classified as a controlled substance. So till the moment we do not have clear regulation and not only national, international, we need to go to the uh, convention of the United Nations of narcotics and drugs. We need to start from there to, to have a clear regulation. What is the problem with the overregulation? It's that the legislator, as I mentioned before, is regulated with fear and with lack of knowledge. But when you understand that the THC is a compound, that yes, it is a psychotropic one, but also can improve in other uses and in other ways the CBD, as an example, then you will be able to regulate with lack, uh, with no fear, and we clear it, with no stigma in the law. That, it, that makes me 
makes me nervous. The stigma in the law. The law is a law. The law regulations are only for me to be following. You know, the attorneys, we read the law. We do not care if the regulator thinks that THC or more than one percent of THC is a major, major public health problem. You know, we're only going to follow what the regulation is stated. So the 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 over regulations came because of the lack of knowledge and uh how you change this you need to to see first to the industry not to regulate because regulate what happened in mexico with the supreme court they have this decree why because they were regulated for regulated only and this is not the model we need to follow we need to change this uh i'm worried um, when I was in Santa Marina, I also elaborate a citizen bill. This was the first citizen bill we submitted before the signature for the regulation, federal regulation of Canada. And what do we do? We go with for interviewing each person in the cannabis business model. Since the registry of the certified seed heal the um, wholesale stores that this is a problem in Mexico. The wholesale stores is a problem because even though it is legal for industrial hemp and for medicinal purposes, wholesale stores and drops stores are not allowing these products, even those are legal. Legal and again, the problem is stigma. The problem lack of knowledge. So uh, we need to see first the industry. What do they need? in accordance for our current regulations, please do not think about a new cannabis Europe institution. I don't know if they are thinking about this, but uh, I am really sure that we all have federal regulation for all the products. So what you need to regulate, it is not a crop. And you can be bothering the, the farmers and the growers with the conformant of KC and the crops. You need to regulate the product and who is going to use this product? Because if the consumer is going to use this for, for medicinal purposes, it needs to be a specific regulation for that. But if this is for consumption, like adult use, will be another regulation. But the first thing we need to see is the consumers, the patients, the industry, and then because of those, start to write the law in order to not over-regulate. think we've already got regulations for alcohol and tobacco and you know same thing alcohol and tobacco can't be abused just like cannabis don't and so packaging everything has to have you know childproof packaging you know what under 21 could purchase the product i mean certain basic regulations that are in tobacco and in, in uh, alcohol should be adopted for cannabis and and everything is already there, you know. So all the regulations for 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 alcohol is that you know is already there. Bonded warehouse security of the product, you know, as it moves from one place to another place. Uh, and even the taxes, you know, if you have a low excise tax, that now punt the illicit market out of business because no one goes around. Many of you go around and say, hey. I know somebody that'll sell you a bottle of vodka cheaper than at the, at the store that's around the Ford. We don't do that. Can you, we just go to the store, we buy the vodka, we pay the tax, and nobody is, is too concerned about. So I've developed some models um, re-examining the dispensary model. And because, like I said earlier, it's end up supply, it's the amount of access, in this price. And so if you live at the access through the dispensary model, then you don't get as much uh, legal participation. So I, I looked at this model where you just open it up, you tax it kind of like alcohol, you regulated it kind of like tobacco or alcohol in, in the sense that you have labeling and, and you check IDs. Uh, but then putting it into grocery stores and gas stations and everything else, um, the, the amount of conversion, uh, was enormous. The amount of opportunities for, um, products and brands and suppliers into the space was enormous. And it really did away with the illicit market very quickly. So 
opening it up, um, giving high volume access um, to more consumers was really a viable model that maximized tax revenue, minimized the impact of the illicit market, um, got people participating, and didn't necessarily have as much of the public health impact as as has been stated by other policymakers. So there are alternative models out there that one can use to really maximize the um, the industry and, and give tremendous opportunities for for people. And so, but and just slow down. This gentleman is a question to answer. So it's bad. Also, maybe that's true. I force him off the sub jury. Now that you went there yourself, saying that you should uh, compare it to alcohol, and uh, the thing is, jury and the baby of wealth, everybody was a whole thing that wants to replace it. It was the market. It's like they want to collaborate, they want to replace it. So uh, we should look back to what prohibition and this also pillar builder about how it was, because the high THC is basically what absinthe was in, in alcohol when. Uh, I think Molly was called whatever. So alcohol today is taxed in different um, tiers by actually alcohol percentage. So the thing that we don't want in cannabis, so we say outrageous, is actually a practice all over Europe. Every European country has a 15%, 32%, 38% of alcohol different taxation. Something to keep in mind. Uh, a different point, I'd love to know your opinion on it, uh, branding. You're only telling half the truth about cookies. Cookies is building a brand, not in the in the dispensaries. Cookies is building a brand in the streets. Cookies is uh, pirated all over the world. We have cookies packs, Tenko packs, and uh, Jungle Boys packs in the streets. This is where the brands are being made. Credibility is created for recreational in the streets, not in the stores. And cookies is probably the only brand. Also, I've been to Toronto lately. There is no brand loyalty in Canada. Cookies is just another store. So... I just want to question a little bit of this and then see what your reaction would be and um, just, yeah, be a little bit real. Thank you. Hey, it's, I think, you know, it, it's really both ways. I mean, you, you have to have some sort of creativity that creates that recognition. Um, but it, it's way it's been successful, at least in the U.S., you know, in, in terms of competitors, because, you know, since it's a private in market, each state is... Yeah, there's all the regulations. You have to get your own license and everything uh, so that by having a brand that is recognized from East Coast to West Coast, at least in the U.S., it's been very successful, should it? What I'm seeing in terms of branding as well is that they're starting to brand user experiences within the brand. And so you may have a cookies. Um, I don't know a whole lot about cookies, but you may have something that is targeted experience to the stalker mod and there's a targeted experience to you know uh, somebody going out and and doing uh, activities sports activities and there's other uh, user experiences branding related to just chilling out watching a load and so I'm starting to see this emerging to where they're branding and uh, the user experience um, and as long as that they have consistent products that meet those consumer expectations, then they develop really good and <laughs> durable brand loyalty, um, you know, out of the gate. And Kripley's just got like a whole, you know, line of clothing at forbidden, you know, uh, things. They're trying to be like Supreme is, you know, as this high end, you know, um, urban brand. And lifestyle, and and the the cannabis products are just part of that lifestyle. And uh, this is an important update because before United States go fully federally regulated for adult use, they al they already have a brand. You know, this is a really good marketing strategy to start building a brand without a regulation, maybe. But you know that cookies will be related with adult use, with re re recreational use, uh, this kind of product. But also, they are selling t-shirts, cap, they are creating a brand, they are creating a lifestyle brand. And when the, re the, the, the regulation comes, they will be ready. They, they will be already there, right? So, so why has cookies been able to expand so rapidly as something that's in our head, which is a very good question. 
is because they use a licensing model. This goes to Mike's point about brand. Cookies, there are some exceptions to what I'm going to say, but Cookies doesn't own its cultivation. Cookies doesn't have its own licenses. Cookies doesn't own its stores. Cookies just licenses the name and puts requirements in place. And yes, I get your exceptions to that rule, but that's how they've been able to expand so rapidly. So to everyone's point here is they've developed a lifestyle brand. They've developed the brand. Does that brand start on the streets? Sure it does. You have to go to the consumers, right? You have to go to the consumers. And of course, the other thing about cannabis, because especially when you're looking at intellectual property laws, IP laws, whether those are copyright, copyrights, trademarks, or uh, other forms of patents, um, a lot of those laws don't necessarily allow protection of certain cannabis uh, IP because of the fact that it's federally illegal in the United States and not exactly legal or straight legal in most other jurisdictions. So it's hard to protect those things. But I do think that this is the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. The initial stages of the industry are how do you attract existing cannabis users away from the illicit market into the regulated commercial market for tax generation otherwise. That's step one. Then step two becomes, how do you attract new users? How do you subclassify users and make a more sophisticated product, a more sophisticated brand for someone who doesn't want to identify with the person on the street that's a cookies culture, for example? All of these things are evolving and it's really, really interesting to watch. Um, now, they have another question back. How do you care? Uh, some so questions. How did that Good morning, uh, great problem. Just uh, not to be naysayer, but the, the statement that both sure we spill or any pile alcohol and we have tobacco, let's be about mileage out of the fly. That's, um, that's not for research. That's an attached to But the couple is this number one, you see in tobacco, it's getting more and more restricted to the point where even they think we should not buy what just make me is now would be, you know, really better and has great time and stuff like that. Out of the looks to big house, naked neat countries, such as prison rat and bubble, they can they have a real faulty billion dollar cover for beyond digit. So and the other issue with Alphamal, the huge issue with Steam Canada at the moment is that the regulator you for but over the health focus so to say, hey, where do we gotta rob an alcohol? Maybe we're the zoo. It's gets too normalized. And maybe we have to restrict alcohol too. And the battle line around risk and public health is around that restriction of alcohol now from you see across the world. And how is a pretty example? Where, for example, for Tisa to be pretty much destroyed by capitalist straight relations escape Canada. They don't have scores, they have gone out her. Lifestyle around is is illegal upon every campus app. And the you know formalization is did to be mad. So this one be very careful around this idea of this cutting the state regulation from other whiskey clouds. And a lot of that goes on as well that goes to this notion that the regulations prohibit advertising in certain jurisdictions or severely limited uh, and they, they prevent what a they store to do as uh, treats it differently than any other, other store. And you can't just go out and, and advertise and market and brand. Um, so so uh, your points are, are very well taken. Uh, does anyone have it? Please feel free to keep asking questions. Yes, sir. That's and what is the and two step points were there, Your Honor. Nasty. So, when does you said it does air? So, counseling the addition he read in the THC levels and what actually read more to the offset and said to the and colleagues are actually and any to raise it as they had more green and price than the dispensaries. So, and I agree this is the case in the CBD market where there's good bees out there who are essentially selling products which support the detain CBD in a very little and how easy that to be combated and then there's obviously a consumption industry run across that the swatch consumer has no balance in the product and they're just not going to buy it. Yeah, I'll come in as about to jump in here, but, but I would tell you this, I would say that the, uh, yes, in the marijuana industry, it's in your interest to produce the highest potency product at the lowest price point, because that is the basic marketplace right now. But one of the reasons why Delta 8, HHC, these hemp-derived intoxicants are thriving 
in the U.S. and around the world is because consumers don't want to get this high. Consumers don't like paranoia. Consumers don't want to walk into a dispensary. They want something that's more like a glass of wine versus a shot of whiskey. So there's a major difference out there in terms of consumer behavior, and you have to figure out what your market is. Bo, would you care to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, it, it depends upon the market and the, and the rape and sorry structure in terms of testing too high or testing too little in terms of THC content. Because in the market, in some states, um, that you get more price per pound, per ounce, per gram, for higher THC product. And so there's testing inflation that's occurring because, you know, you want your brand to have the highest amount of THC. Um, and then in other states where, and jurisdictions where they're testing on the percentage of THC, then there's that incentive. <laughs> for those to be lower. Now, when you think of policy around tax, what does tax do? It either incentivizes or subsidizes something to do, uh, to do something more, or it punishes to do something less, like high taxes on cigarettes uh, produce less consumption. So right now, there's not a really good strategy on how to tax this, because they, the, the regulators and the tax policymakers really don't know what they want out of this. They just want the money, right? And so they don't have effective strategies yet um, on, you know, what is the purpose of all of this, right? And so they're, they're creating distortions in the market. Uh, and then, um, like I said, on the, uh, on the CPE side, um, you know, that's been in the United States, at least, relatively unregulated. So there hasn't been any labeling, truth and label, truth and products or anything like that. So there's groups out there that, that test and rigorously test their products. Um, in some instances, five or six times throughout the process. And then there's others that barely tested at all, if at, if at all. And so you've got, because of the lack of regulation and oversight, you've got this market out there that's kind of kind of the wild west is a free for all. And so a lot of the, um, the hemp derived cannabinoid producers and suppliers and retailers, they actually want to be regulated. Um, but just like you said, you just don't want to be too regulated or regulated like the schedule one truck, you know? So, uh, so it just depends upon what the objective is and what the market is as to whether or not you're going to see inflation in the testing or deflation in the testing and like. We have had some for a question. Right to you about rich discussion on um, my mini card group, take evidence. The question I have there is you kind of about what's going on currently in the attention about in the video. If the being has to lay off some of the major feature building with for the bow, um, you know, not as a secret quarter surprise for them. Um, but my question would be, you know, going to this period in South Asia, you know, we know from from the third that there are going to be some, you know, players that are going to try to go, you know, they need to get this game down during the, the tennis industry. So, like, what's you know, where do you think the bat's going to come from? You think, you know, who's going to be the most aggressive type players, do you think? Would it be, you know, big tobacco, pharma, uh, big alcohol, perhaps, uh, equity firms? Uh, what are your thoughts? And, and because we're running out of time here, I, I, I'd like everybody to sort of hit this question and we can sort of round this out if that works. Um, I'll tell you that, like, I just wrote an article, like, I read a Forbes column. I wrote an article in Forbes where I compare the first 10 years of the tech industry to the first 10 years in the cannabis industry. And it addresses some of these points. Uh, but think of this when the bubble burst at the tech in the tech boom, we didn't know what Google was, we didn't know what Badison was. Those things didn't exist at that time. So those people, after 10 years in the tech industry, they went, this is over. It's all over. All of these people, who's going to be the winner or the loser? The point is, you don't know who the winners and the losers are going to be in cannabis because everyone has to keep trying, and it's way too soon, in my bit. I think the winner will be the company who achieves to integrate uh, 
social responsibility, uh, excellence marketing strategy. This company needs to be one of the first ones because as we think with the example of cookies, I argument and disarguments, but they are one of the first ones. And uh, this company needs to see what and learn what uh, we're being through in other markets in order to not repeat those mistakes, right? Um, this needs to be a disruptive company, which is lived by by new and uh, young uh, minds, but all the times listening to the folders and uh, and and learning of, of the others, you know. But uh, Canada is, is a dis disruptive market in, in all our, around the world. And this is the reason why we are here. So, I don't know. I, I think the ones that are going to buy, buy and succeed are going to be the ones that have a good management. You know, many people forget that Steve Jobs, you know, started Apple and built it up into a billion dollar company and then he was fired by the board because great visionary, but not an executive NBA, you know, to, to run a billion dollar enterprise. And many of these cannabis companies are being run by inexperienced people and, and that's going to be changing it. And we're seeing it now where more and more uh, people from the food and beverage industry are coming into the market. They're demanding firms like ours to produce data analytics for them to say, how much is this product selling for? Am I making money on this? What's my margin? You know, but what's my inventory, what's my, uh, all these things that they need to know about their company in order to run it, you know, efficiently. And I think those are the ones that are going to succeed along with the ones that have access to Kempel because right now it's very difficult for canvas companies to obtain GACO when you can go ahead and invest in a Fortune 500 companies right now that down from their historic high. Uh, stock plates. So I think that that's with the two things that are going to, you know, outline if it's going to be it in the next 10 years. I've said in, uh, for years now that, and that redefining factors in the Canada space will be branding, scale, and supply chain management. And so if you can manage your brand, get your brand out there, if you can scale it out of if you can manage your costs to where you're or made it profitable, then you're going to be successful in this space. Um, with respect to the jobs and the layoffs, this, uh, to me is a natural flow. Um, what cannabis represents as an industry in economics is called an entrepreneurial event. And so there's um, at an opportunity to uh, achieve higher than normal profits. Um, and when you achieve those, then everybody wants in. And so you've seen some people early on that had the profits, but then everybody jumped in and took all the profits out. Um, and so what um, what results from that when everybody enters in is it drives down their profitability and it drives down their margins and then um, that things consolidate. So, you know, there's this, you know, period of multi-phases of, of um, expansion and consolidation, expansion and consolidation. And I think that we're just in the earlier phases of this right now. And then um, I'm producing a Josh report um, uh, that's in conjunction with Leafly. Every year we co-author a Josh report. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, similar to what occurred in Canada uh, early on with uh, this um, expansion and installed capacity for production capabilities and the like. You saw that a bit with the multi-state operators of the United States, where they wanted to go into these new markets, figuring that the demand will grow. Uh, and they installed the capacity, um, but now realizing that there's been a little bit of a reset in the market, um, they don't mean to hire us um, to staff that capacity. And so they're, they're just laying in wait um, but meanwhile, because the, the market is it is starting to compress from a margin perspective, and they are started are starting to have to cut costs, and so um, we're seeing that there were jobs added, 
in uh, 2022, but there was a lot. Uh, they wouldn't add in more, but had it not been for the uh, layoffs and other downsizing for the large of MSS. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the wonderful panel, Bob Hubbard, Mariana, Maria, Mike, and Ralph, and go with me. And we're going to conclude this first session of the reconvene. But before that, 